Well, good afternoon and welcome to Deep in Scripture. This is your host, Marcus Grodi, and you're coming to us from the studios of the Coming Home Network International. And just in case it's your first time joining us, you can find out more about our work at chnetwork.org or more about this program, particularly at deepinscripture.com. We've been doing this for a few years. And uh, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter and all the usual sites. But do thank you for joining us in our little angle that we're taking on deep in scripture right now is looking at hard verses uh, the, a great many christians just presume that uh, the bible is uh, not only our our wonderful source for faith but that it's always easily explicable and the truth is that most people who study the scriptures after a while run across a few verses that are difficult to explain uh, either you try and come up with a quick explanation, how to fit that into my theology, or maybe I just can't figure it out, so I keep it up on the nice shelf until I come up with a good answer. And I know when I was a Presbyterian pastor, I had a bunch of those that didn't quite fit my theology, but it's the Word of God, so what do I do with it? Well, uh, my guest today, who's a wonderful friend, and it's, it's a privilege to have Jimmy Aiken join us on the program uh, he's chosen a verse that, I, honestly, I don't remember that I ever talked about from the pulpit. Fortunately, I'd, I wasn't stuck to a, a schedule. I could choose for myself whatever I could preach on Sunday, so I think I avoided this verse. But first, let me welcome to the program Jimmy Aiken. Welcome, Jimmy. Thank you so much, Marcus. It's a pleasure to be here. It's good. I, the bad thing about our friendship is that you're way over on the, on the far coast on one side of the yeah. world from me, so I never get a chance to see you. But I well, now we have Skype exactly. But I want to take the time on air to thank you for all your work. And I know anyone that does any Googling on the Internet about things Catholic run across your articles. And uh, in fact, if they wanted to find out more about what you're doing, where would they go? Um, kind of the central location for my stuff online is Jimmy dot com. That's J I M M Y. A K I N, just just four letters, no extra T's or E's or S's, just A K I N, dot com, and I use that as a hub for all the different things I do online. Um, I, I wanted to say I really I, I was struck by your analogy just now of putting verses on the shelf, yeah. because one of the first things I did when I became uh, an evangelical at about age twenty was I said, okay, well I need to read the Bible, so I read my way through the Bible. And I was later when I became Catholic, I found out, oh, wait, I didn't read the whole thing. There are these seven extra books. So I felt a little cheated. But um, when I first read through it, I, I hit these verses in the Gospels in particular, which um, just did not fit with my evangelical theology. And um, and I said, okay, well, I'm a, I'm a new Christian. I don't know a whole lot. And so for myself, I use the exact same metaphor of I'm going to put these on the shelf, and then maybe later on when I know more, I'll take them off the shelf and figure out how they should be integrated into theology. And when that time came, I ended up concluding, okay, I, they really mean what they say. They sounded Catholic. They really are Catholic, and that means I've got to be a Catholic. And so um, uh, I was struck by that metaphor because it's exactly how I conceptualized it when I hit these kind of verses. Yeah. When I was in seminary, Jimmy, I, I went as a Congregationalist. Mm -hmm. I was brought up Lutheran, and I went as a Congregationalist, but a strong Calvinist, New England Congregationalist. And when I was in seminary, uh, I met a young man. We became great friends, especially on the racquetball court. But he happened to be a staunch Arminian Methodist, Wesleyan. Mm -hmm. And we, we got along great for about three, four months that, that semester. But then we encountered a verse. And it was that verse where God knows every, the number of every hair on our heads. You know, mm -hmm. that whole aspect of Calvinism in which God has control, his will, his, his providence, his, his uh, predestination. Uh, every little thing, and my Methodist friend, we could never come to an agreement. And to this mm -hmm. day, I'll tell you something I regret, is that we had a breakdown in our friendship because we oh. could not come to an agreement on that verse because of our mm -hmm. theologies. 
we didn't speak for the rest of the semester. And when I came back from break, he had moved to another seminary. I never saw him again. The reason, oh. I, the reason I mention that, though, is mm-hmm. that verses can be hard depending on your theology. And you put them up there on the, sometimes on the shelf because you don't want them to stand in between yourself and other Christians. How do you deal with this verse? Mm-hmm. And I think the verse that you've chosen is a good example of that. So given your background, evangelical background, what's the verse that you'd like us to look at today? Uh, well, with a little bit of context, it's Matthew sixteen eighteen. This is the famous, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church verse. And um, it was one that, you know, when I first encountered it in the Gospels, kind of sounds like Jesus is making Peter the leader of his church. You know, I mean, subordinate to himself, of course. Um, and, you know, this is a, a perennial point of discussion between Protestants and Catholics. And there's kind of a standard uh, response that's been developed and that you'll hear from from many Protestants and many evangelicals. And it was the response that I picked up. Uh, you know, you, there's slight variations on it, but basically... Well, let me, this, how, how, maybe I should yeah, read it yeah, first yeah. for audience, just in case they don't know it. So you hold that. Let me read it. And for those of you, this is Matthew. You want me to begin with... Um, uh, How about with uh, Jesus's question? Who Fifteen. Do you say that I oh, very good, very good. Um, Jesus said, "Now, when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do men say that the Son of Man is?' And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, "'But who do you say that I am?' And Simon Peter replied, "'You are the Christ, the Son of the living God.' And Jesus answered him, "'Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the powers of death shall not prevail against it. Mm-hmm. All right. Go ahead, Jim. Right. Yeah, so um, so there's kind of a standard response in, in evangelical circles to this, and the response hinges <clears throat> on saying that Jesus is not identifying Peter with the rock here, that he's actually contrasting them. Uh, and so there is a there is a kind of parallelism between Peter and the rock. Obviously, the name Peter means rock, uh, so they're not denying that there's a parallelism here, but they're, they're saying it's what's sometimes called antithetical parallelism, that it's a contrast. So Jesus is saying, well, Peter, you're a rock in one sense, but on this other rock, I'm going to build my church. And they, uh, there are various interpretations of what the other rock is supposed to be. Often you'll hear people say it's Peter's faith. And that never quite made sense to me as an evangelical. Um, what did make sense to me, though, was saying it's because he's just been talking about the fact that he's the Christ the Son of the Living God. That's the immediate prior context. And so the way I interpreted it was to say that um, the rock is the revelation that Jesus is the Christ, that that's the fundamental thing, the revelation of his identity as the Christ that his church is built on. And, um, and so then I would appeal to the Greek text here, uh, because there's a feature in the Greek text that invariably comes up, and it's the fact that when Peter, when Jesus addresses Peter, he uses the Greek word petros, and then when he refers to the rock, he uses the word petra, and they're not quite the same word. They have different endings in Greek. Uh, To use the English alphabet, petros has an O-S ending, petra has just an A for an ending. And um, commonly, very, very commonly, you will hear people say, okay, um, this is proof that Peter is not the same thing as the rock. And in fact, uh, according to this claim, Petros means like a small stone, and Petra means a great big huge rock, like you might find on the side of a cliff. And um, so that's the basic claim. Now, it turns out, that's not true. Um, Petra and Petros were were used differently in some 
dialects of Greek. Uh, the Protestant scholar D.A. Carson, if you look in the Expositor's Bible Commentary, he admits that <clears throat> this distinction really wasn't there at the time. And so this distinction tended to be confined to some early Greek poetry, but it wasn't in common use. And so there's a problem with the, linguist, with the linguistic claim. What struck me, though, was one day I was, I was an evangelical. I was reading along in a book of Catholic uh, theology because one of the things that I had uh, realized early on after I became a Christian was that I shouldn't base my theology based on which churches were within driving distance, <laughs> you know. I didn't want to reflexively fall into a theology just because that happened to be the most convenient church to go to. And so I made a point of studying the theologies of all different kinds of Christians, including Christians that I thought, well, these people have to be wrong, and but I still need to know about what they believe. And so I was reading a book of Catholic theology. It had an extended quotation from this passage, and as I was reading it, <clears throat> I realized there were structural features that were obvious in the text, even in English, that required that Peter be the rock. And once I saw that, and it just, it only took, you know, a moment once I saw it, I said, okay, I've got to rethink this entire passage. It's clear Peter is the rock that Jesus is talking about. And that means I not only have to look at the papacy, with an open mind, but I have to do a review of all of the categories of systematic theology with an open mind towards the Catholic position. And it took me about a year to do that, um, during which I ignored a lot of my work in grad school. Um, <laughs> I still still got good grades, but I, I, I was really focused on the theology that year. And um, at the end of that, I concluded I had to become a Catholic. And so this verse <clears throat> actually played a pivotal role in my conversion. There was this moment where I suddenly saw these structural features and realized Peter has to be the rock. You know, your reference of that Protestant scholar kind of um, poking a, a hole in the balloon of an argument that was passed along reminds me that one of the problems is that when people are looking for an answer for a hard verse, when they hear someone they re they respect give an answer, maybe on the on the cuff, then that answer gets picked up and passed on, and pretty soon it's it's yeah. uh, defide, and and people are passing it along not because they did any work to come up with that answer, but because they heard somebody else said it. They're not a hundred percent sure that that person really did their homework, or they made some comment. And that's kind of what that scholar was saying, that this Petra Petros thing. It doesn't really hold up. Yeah, that's one of the reasons that I personally, in my own apologetics ministry, I try to rigorously test everything that I say. I don't always have the opportunity to, to do that at the moment, but I always try to go back and check and run things back to their original sources because I see that phenomenon happening so much. Fortunately, these days there are a lot of Protestant scholars who are willing to acknowledge that in this passage, uh, Peter is the rock. Uh, D.A. Carson is one example of that. Another would be F.F. F. Bruce. In fact, if you read his book, Hard Sayings of the Bible, hmm. um, he's got it right there when he discusses this passage. Now, he he'll, he's a Baptist, so he says, well, this doesn't imply the papacy. But he does acknowledge that at least this much of the Catholic case is true, that Jesus is talking about Peter as the rock. Yeah, sometimes they'll affirm that Jesus was talking about Peter, but it doesn't extend beyond Peter's death. Right. It, it doesn't pass on. Right. And so as if and there are various ways to uh, to deal with that. In fact, I've got an entry on that in a new book I have coming out called The Daily Defense, where I talk about, well, so what implications does this verse have for the future? And one of the things I point out, and this is also actually pointed out by F.F. F. Bruce, is that uh, in this passage, because Jesus is talking about the keys to the kingdom, I'm going to yeah. give you the keys to the kingdom, um, that's actually a reference to a passage in the book of Isaiah, where you have an office being passed from one leader, is the chief steward of the house of David, uh, who had a key 
that was the symbol of his office. And in Isaiah, that office is being transitioned from one person to another. And that's the passage in Isaiah that forms the background to Jesus's discussion of the keys here. And that would suggest that, okay, Peter, number one, is the chief steward of the house of the new David, Jesus himself. And it would also suggest that just like the old office of chief steward, the new office of chief steward is also going to be one that involves a succession of people. But then there's the, the fact that if you think about it, it's, it's really kind of blindingly obvious. The church is not going to need less leadership in the future uh, than it's going to need right then when it amounted to a few dozen people. Or if you hundred, then you actually had Jesus himself heading it, and he still felt the need to appoint Peter. And once it grows over the centuries into millions and then now over a billion people, it's going to need leadership just as much and even more. And so you would expect, since Jesus made provisions for his church until he returns, that this leadership office would be one that would be passed down. You know, I wanted to point this out to the audience because they, they might have in front of them a Revised Standard Version or even a Revised Standard Version Catholic Edition, and they'll notice in the footnotes that the the committee that did the translation of the Revised Standard Version as well as the, the eventual Catholic Edition left in the footnotes the, the notes saying Greek Petros and Greek Petra, and they're in the notes, and some might say, well, well, why is it there? Isn't that making a point of what, you know, contrary to what you just talked about? And the, the reason I want to point that out is it gives you an example to show that sometimes the committees have a bit of an agenda. Mm -hmm. The RSV was a, was a Protestant translation. Mm -hmm. um, and Jimmy, I think you would agree that there are probably lots of other places in the New Testament where there are lots of footnotes mm -hmm. you would love to have to show Greek nuances uh, that are in the text that would really make a good point, like uh, Hail Mary full of grace. I'd love to have that in the footnotes, uh, mm -hmm. you know, what was in the original language. But, you know, why would they make this point? Well, it's because it goes back to recognizing that this verse seems to be a bit too Catholic on its view of Peter, and so they have in the footnotes this yeah. little it's there yeah and and sometimes it even goes beyond the footnotes and actually you'll get translator bias in the translation of the text itself <clears throat> my favorite example of that is the way the greek word hagios gets translated um now as uh as catholics we use the word saint not just to refer to living christians but also to canonized saints or other people, who, even if they're not canonized, who are in heaven. And the, the, the question of saints was a big one at the time of the Reformation, and many people in the Protestant tradition put a lot of emphasis on earthly living Christians being the saints, and they kind of wanted to marginalize and, you know, kind of partition the saints in heaven from that, and they didn't want a lot of attention focused on them. And so, um, that's resulted in quite a number of modern translations translating the Greek word for saint, hagios, inconsistently, yeah. so that whenever it refers to someone on earth, they translate it as saint, but whenever it refers to someone in heaven, they translate it as holy one, yeah. and they thus uh, end up in the text itself, as you know, part of translator bias, they end up trying to partition the heavenly saints and diminish the recognition of them as saints. Yeah, another good example of that, Jimmy, is in the NIV version, the the word Greek word for tradition. Oh, yes. Or teachings. Yes, it gets t translated as teachings whenever the reference is to tr tradition is positive, but it gets translated as tradition whenever the reference is negative. Yeah, that's another great example. Yeah, Second Th Thessalonians 2.15 where it says, stand firm and hold to the traditions. Well, in the NIV, it's to the teachings. It doesn't yeah, want to use that word. Tradition, or in, in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, Paul commends the, the uh, Corinthians for holding fast to the traditions, but it has to say teachings there because they don't want any positive references to tradition. Now, 
going back to the verse that you addressed it as a hard verse, we do recognize that St. Augustine himself in his writings did affirm mm -hmm. that Jesus was talking about the faith of Peter mm -hmm. in this passage. There, yeah, and that's not a problem from the Catholic point of view, because one of the things that uh, we recognize is that Scripture operates on more than one level, and a single symbol can have more than one thing it refers to, more than one referent. Um, an obvious example of that is from the book of Revelation, where we read that the uh, seven heads of the beast represent both seven mountains and seven kings. So John tells us right there, this one symbol, the seven heads, refers to two different things. And so uh, from a Catholic perspective, you can look at a symbol like the rock and see it having more than one significance. And in fact, if you look in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, it attributes both of these to this symbol. Um, but what you can't legitimately do is deny that Peter is one of the references, and I would even argue he's the primary reference yeah. here yeah. for reasons we can talk about. Yeah, in in my own journey, in uh, it, the final stone for me that had to to get un, uh, stepped over when I became Catholic was the issue of Peter mm -hmm. and the papacy, and it was because of John Henry Newman's essay on the development of doctrine that helped me understand the developed understanding of of the papacy. Uh, which really was more solidified in the history of the Church even before the Trinity or the mm -hmm. divinity of Christ was the recognition of the authority of the, of the Pope of Rome. But for me, the issue was in this, everything you've said um, was that Peter, our Lord affirmed Peter, not because of his intellect, because of his willful strength, because of, of him, but because of the evidence of the work of grace in his mm -hmm. life, and that's exactly what Jesus affirms. It was the Father that gave mm -hmm. you this faith, and it was because of the faith that's in you, Peter, that you then, by your uh, submission to the Heavenly Father, acted on that faith by grace to affirm and encourage who Jesus was. That's why you're Peter. That's why you're rock, and that mm -hmm. becomes the foundation for all that we are. So it's kind of a mm -hmm. both and. It is the yes. faith of Peter, but that's why he's Peter, because mm -hmm. of the work of grace in his life. Yeah. So would you like me to point out the features that caused me to have my pivot on this? Oh, question? yes, 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 yes. I wasn't sure yeah. if you wanted it. Wonderful. Please do. Oh, absolutely. Um, okay, so to, to look at the passage structurally, and this is stuff that's obvious even in English. You don't have to go to the Greek. Um, you know, we have this exchange between Jesus and Peter, where Jesus says, who do you say that I am? Peter says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus says three things to him in response. The first thing is in verse 17. He says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. That's the first thing. It starts with blessed are you. The second thing is, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of death, or the powers of death, or the gates of hell, however you want to translate it, will not prevail against it. So that's the second thing, starts with you are Peter. The third thing is, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So that's verses 17, 18, and 19. Now, each one of those three statements is a statement about Peter. The first one, blessed are you. The second one, you are Peter. The third one, I will give you the keys to the kingdom. So this is all about Peter, these three statements. Now, if Jesus were contrasting Peter with the rock, if Petros, you know, Peter, you're a little tiny stone, but on the great big rock, I'm going to build my church— this really wouldn't scan with this passage because it would end, it, Jesus would end up saying something like, Blessed are you, Simon of Arjona. You're a really insignificant rock. Here are the keys to the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> and so, just reading it in context, that middle statement, it's very clear if the first statement is a blessing on Peter, blessed are you, can't get more explicit than that, and if the third statement is a blessing on Peter, here are the keys to the kingdom of heaven, then that middle statement, you are Peter, 
is also going to be a blessing. He's not dissing Peter. He's not tearing him down. He's building him up. And so that was the first thing that I noticed structurally, even in English, that suggests that we need to read this not as antithetical parallelism, where we contrast Peter and the rock, but as synthetic parallelism, where the two images build on each other and contribute to each other. The other thing I noticed is that each part, uh, each one of the three statements has three parts. Uh, in the case of uh, the first statement, we have, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, that's the first part. And then Jesus says two things that explain that. Flesh and blood has not revealed that to you, that's the second part, but my Father who is in heaven. Those second two parts explain why Peter is blessed. If you look at the third statement, you have the basic statement, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and then he says two more things that explain that first part. The second thing is whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And the third part is whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So that's what it means for Peter to have the keys. He has both the power to bind and the power to loose. So the first statement has three parts, with the second two explaining the initial statement. The third one has three parts, with the second two explaining the first. Guess what? Same thing for that middle statement. <laughs> you are Peter. That's the first part. On this rock, I will build my church. That's the second part. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's the third part. So what it means, what you are Peter means, is I'm going to build a church on you, and the gates of hell are not going to prevail against it. And so right there you have this amazing symmetry once again. Uh, it's not just taking the second statement in the context of the first and the third. It's also each statement has two explanatory parts that tell you about the meaning of the first. And this once again shows Peter is indeed the rock. You know, what's powerful about that, lots of things, Jimmy, but one of them is that's the way you do exegesis. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's the way, as a, as a Protestant, as a Presbyterian, I did exegesis. It was, that's exactly what my sermon would be about, is those kinds of arguments. And they're clear. That's ex On your website, jimmyaiken.com, do you have that written out Yes, somewhere? I do. Yeah, there's a, a piece. I uh, was invited up to um, Biola University a number of years ago to give a lecture to a class that they were giving for evangelicals about Catholicism. And so I, uh, I wrote out my lecture notes, and it's called uh, Why Be Catholic and Exercise for Evangelicals. And I go through all that in that. So if you Google Why Be Catholic, Jimmy Aiken, or an exercise for evangelicals, Jimmy Aiken, you should run across that paper. And it's there at jimmyaiken.com. All right, Jimmy. Thanks for joining us today and sharing that. That's excellent. And all of you listening, I encourage you to go to his website. And, and uh, anything you read from Jimmy is uh, trustworthy and uh, an encouragement. So, Jim, thank you for joining us today. Thank, thank you so much, Marcus, and God bless your staff and all of your work. Thank you very much. And thank all of you for joining us on Deep in Scripture. Again, go to deepinscripture.com to find out more about what we're doing. We'd love to hear from you. If you have a question, please send a question to dis at chnetwork.org. God bless. See you again next week. I came from a non-religious family, really. Um, we didn't know, we didn't attend church on a regular basis. We were what I call holiday Methodists. Um, our family tried church several different times, but never anything on a regular basis. And we definitely didn't have any instruction at home. So basically, I remember this one moment where I'm looking through a Bible that I have I was confirmed within the Methodist church and, and nothing against the Methodists, but I remember saying, you know, I see all these pastor signatures, but I don't know a thing about Jesus. 
you know, as I've described it before, there was some, there was a deep calling to deep. I just didn't know um, how to put words on it. And when I came to know Jesus Christ, of course, there's this entire world that opens up to you called the scriptures, called the Bible. You begin remembering scriptures that say, hey, where two or three members gather together, there you are in the midst. And then when you're there praying with your brothers and sisters, you actually feel the very presence of the Holy Spirit. There's a real emphasis on reading the scripture and trying to understand it and apply it to our lives and uh, an experience uh, usually through prayer with Christ. Hindsight's always twenty twenty. So one of the things that I, I realized today that I didn't know in the moment was that Christ, we believe this as evangelicals and as Catholics, that Christ is the one who saves us. This is really kind of what brought me uh, to the place of exploring Catholicism. I was 10 years a pastor uh, at various different levels and in, in various different spaces, uh, five years basically as a missionary. And it was during that, that missionary time where I said, you know, there's got to be something more than simply this general spiritual body of Christ. Prior to ever leaving the pastorate, I asked myself one day, do you believe in transubstantiation? This is an internal question. And I said, I, I think I do. I mean, I come from a charismatic background. Why couldn't it actually become the body and the blood of Christ? I began to realize this, that that, that which I thought was strange, once I investigated it, guess what happened? It wasn't so strange anymore. And it's definitely different than my evangelical, um, basically Baptist background, Methodist background. It, it is definitely different than that. But that being said, that difference is pretty surface. Let's get down deeper and look at what the church is actually teaching. And you find a lot of commonality. There was, there felt like there was a, a depth within Catholicism and Catholic thought and theology um, that I didn't find in another place. Now, this is my personal journey, um, but it was my journey. I would say uh, to encourage anybody on the journey, uh, a key to that is to be open, uh, to read, to study, to ask questions. And my encouragement to my fellow journeymen, okay, folks on the journey, uh, disciples of Jesus Christ, is to, rather than draw a conclusion off the statement of somebody else, to actually go and say, as I said to myself, what does the church say about this? What's fascinating to me about the apostles is what were they constantly stressing? Unity, unity, unity. What is one of the things that plagues the church more than anything? I'm talking my, my Protestant brothers and sisters that I love. What is the thing that plagues us more than anything else? There are more churches cropping up on a daily basis. There is more fragmentation. There is more disunity. There is more disconnection. The long and the short of it is, is there are, uh, there were too many, you know, you begin to read into this, there were just too many questions. I realized, wait a second, there is a, a big history here that needs to be explored, and, and it's been a fun exploration. Mm -hmm.